When life throws you a curveball, how are you going to handle adversity? Welcome to the Fearless Mindset Podcast, where you're about to go on a journey as I interview security, business, and entertainment leaders on what it takes to stay fearless. I'm your host, Mark Ludlow, and enjoy today's episode. Hello, everybody. Mark Ludlow here with the Fearless Mindset Podcast, and uh, we're rolling out some high-powered guests this week. You guys just heard Jack Carr just being released a couple of days ago, and we'll do another episode with him. And today we're changing it up a little bit. We actually have a doctor, <laughs> a doctor in medicine on the podcast. He's, uh, he's really uh, doing some great things for the industry. And I want to thank Mike for his time. We've been trying to work this out for the last few months to get him on, and the time is limited working in the medical world. So, Mike, thanks for coming on. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for your time. Yeah, it's good to see you in person again since Vegas. So in person, exactly. Yeah. Well, maybe not in person, but your face. <laughs> you too, buddy. You too. And you know, you you have seen a lot being in. Uh, you work at a hospital, and you do a lot of triage stuff. And we're just talking about how life is so precious. And like you said, we all get stuck in chasing that almighty dollar, but. Like you just said, you know, we're not even promised the next five hours. We're just pro- promised this moment. And people fail to realize we need it. We need to relish in the moment, be present in the moment. And I think really, I think we all were, you know, we're a lot of us are in the, you know, work social media platforms, all the Facebook groups. Everybody's just trying to hustle, 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 mm-hmm. hustle. And they forget about those people, their loved ones that are around them in that moment. And they give that moment to just so many distractions out there. What is what is what can you share to the audience of what you've seen in the medical world that could be an add value to people in the exec protection industry, to people that are you know money hungry? What is your advice to them for a positive mental attitude? Yeah, I mean, so in the medical field, you start to to realize that life is precious, right? You you're not promised tomorrow. We, we I mentioned this to you earlier. You're not even promised, you know, the next minute. You know, any one of us can have a cardiac event or go down mm-hmm. for, for whatever reason, have a stroke. And, and you know, that's basically the beginning of the end. And, uh, you know, the way I live my life is, you know, it, I had children late in life, you know, in my 40s. And, you know, they're still young. And I've kind of set myself up in uh, a career and with investments where I now I'm able to just kind of slow down, uh, focus on more stuff that I enjoy kind of stay away from the stuff that I see as quote unquote work uh, and enjoy my children, (laughs) take them to school and and pick them up from school and and go to their dance class and their T-ball class and, or, you know, their, their T-ball practice and, and just kind of enjoy life. You know, I I think the, the chasing the almighty dollar or being, you know, told as a child to have a one month goal, a five-year goal, a 10-year goal, that's great. And that's all fine and dandy. As long as you're not kind of forgetting the people that are going to help you get there, your, you know, your friends, your family, um, you know, whatever your, your faith is and, you know, continue that also. So uh, the medical field uh, teaches you real quick to, to be humble, uh, to realize that tomorrow is never promised. I mean, I've seen, you know, little infants, die i've seen children drown i've seen older people who you know it was time for them to go die and i've seen everything in between you know where just a random event happens and someone and passes this earth and you know it it just it's just a a complete reminder but human nature is give it a day give it a couple days you forget and you go into your bad old habits until you get reminded again do you see a difference in how people pass away I mean, we're going to kind of get in deep on the conversation here. I mean, the audience is like, what the heck are you talking about, Mark? But low, where are you going with this? I'm listening to, you're supposed to be a, a bodyguard podcast or executive protection podcast. But I want to change it up a little bit <clears throat> and take it from the difference of people. Do people, you see people pass away peacefully, like they have hope on the next phase of life or people are angry and they just fight, fight, fight. Do you, yeah. Can you explain to the audience what do you, what have you seen out there when people leave this life and go on to the next? What, what have you seen as a doctor? Yeah, so, you know, that's an interesting one because I'm only aware of it here in the United States where, you know, there's a different social norm um, compared to maybe some other countries, you know, and, and it depends. I mean, there's, there's some families where, you know, they have elderly 
family members who have stage four cancer. And, you know, there's some families that say, listen, I'm ready to, and they buy for, you know, and they, and they fork off. And one is we're ready to do cancer, chemo, radiation, this, that for that 10 or 20% chance of, uh, you know, maybe prolonging life for another six months. And then the others are like, well, this is my calling. You tell me I have six months. I'm going to enjoy my six months without the <laughs> chemo, the radiation, mm. the nausea, the hair loss, and everything that comes with modern medicine trying to extend life. And that's just kind of the way they live life. And it, from what I've seen, it's just based on people's faith. You know, are they happy with their life on earth here or are they going to enjoy the time with their you know, family and friends on, on earth and, and move on to, you know, whatever they believe is, is, is waiting for them after their body leaves this, you know, this planet. Um, and I know many other countries, they just embrace that and they do, don't they? They do. And it's just time to go. And here in this country, it's like, it's a fight. It's sometimes they, you know, family because of guilt or whatever will flog, you know, the patient by just having all these just terrible, painful, uh, tons of procedures that have tons of side effects and just kind of prolong that life, but it's a, a miserable life. It's a life of suffering. So mm. uh, it's, it's kind of a societal, uh, cultural thing. And yeah, I, I've seen both in this, you know, society and culture, but yeah, I, I think there's a lot more in the United States of doing everything possible. We're going to do everything. And, and, and sometimes I get in my in my gut, it's more for the family than it is for the actual patient. So true. Yeah, I would agree with that. Or the stuff that I had to go through with my dad had stage four brain cancer. He's like, don't hold me back. If I'm going, I'm going. Do not resuscitate me. I do not. I do not. I want a non resuscitation order. Right. Like, really, dad? I'm like, don't keep me here. He was a pastor. He's a believer. Oh, yeah. And, and he's like, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go see the Lord and. I'm going to go to heaven and see your mom. Yeah. Like, I mean, if he, okay. If all right. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Whatever if, he, if he's a, a Christian and his belief is there's his life after our physical body mm -hmm. here on earth. And that's his belief. I mean, that's the reality is what he's waiting for is to enjoy his time on life, spread yeah. his word, spread mm -hmm. the Lord's word, and then right. move on, you yeah. know, <laughs> move on to basically much greener pastures where actually, <laughs> right. you know, where the grass is truly greener on the other side and not this. Sure. You know, grass is greener on the other side that happens here where it's usually not. True. So true. So words of wisdom right there. And I, yeah, I think it's like you said, everybody's perspective on how they look at life and if they have a hope and a faith. And, you know, that carries them through the the, the time on, on earth when they go through you know, stage four diseases, a cancer, whatever. Yeah. So I, I just want to get your thoughts on that. And uh, how you you have an interesting track because you've been a, a doctor for a while and I, we bounced into each other on LinkedIn and you said, Hey, I, I'm getting into, I'm getting interested in the EP stuff. And you, you see a need in the executive protection industry that's lacking, obviously. Is everybody so gung ho on guns and ARs and stuff? And I said, 1% chance you'll ever use a weapon system for protection. And you have a 99% chance of using something from a medical background to save a principal or somebody in, in that principal's organization. So are you seeing a transition from people you're talking to of uh, uh, wanting corporate organizations, wanting more medical now? Is that kind of what you're seeing yeah, as you step I, in foot? You know, I was never, I was introduced to this, this whole concept of executive protection, corporate security about three and a half years ago. And it was, I've mentioned this on other podcasts, just dumb luck and a friend of a friend, you know, uh, was looking for a medical director for their private family office for their ultra high net worth client and you know my name popped up and, and we had talks and i've been doing it for the last three and a half years and then within this last six months or eight months that's where i've kind of you know really got active on linkedin and you know i'm starting to see a very it's slow trust me it's slow um and it's slow because of basically the cost it's going to take for medical everybody knows anything medical is just more expensive um, but it's, but I start to see the kind of the winds of change as, as time goes on, where people are trying to implement more medical. Now it may be simple medical where they're just trying to train all their EP personnel with just basic emergency medical responders, CPR, first aid, AED, stop the bleed tourniquet use, things like that. 
or I've seen the transition where teams are actively looking for paramedics, you know, soft guys with medical uh, backgrounds, 18 deltas, PJs, you know, and kind of implementing them in their team. They're getting, you know, double bang for their buck because they're getting that special force EP guy, but they're also getting someone who's got extensive, you know, background in medical. So, you know, I think that's going to be, and, and, and I've never been an advocate for teams needing just straight EP guys and straight medical or, or both. I, I think you need your, obviously you need your security, you know, practitioners, and either you attach a medical practitioner who's cross trained in EP, um, that would be the best, you know, it's just one less extra person that's there. Um, and that's it. Not every, not hundred percent of all people on all security teams need to be medical. That's just not realistic. Um, and would be way too cost prohibitive. Um, so yeah, I, I'm seeing it. It's just, it's, it's taken time, but it's okay with all good, you know, all good things take time. So can you elaborate on the medical training that at the SF folks really get, they get? Can you uh, put a little elaboration on that kind of training they have to go through? To, is it equivalent to like an EMT certification or what would you oh. describe that like? I mean, I know the PJs, all the PJs I work with are all paramedics. So they're, they're training, okay. they, the training they actually get is paramedic equivalent. So they basically mm -hmm. come out. Um, I mean, or I guess technically they're in as paramedics. And then when they come out to the civilian sector, you know, they can just license through the state. They get nationally registered uh, NREMT uh, to basically get get licensed in the state and then credentialed, you know, in whatever area that they're working. Um, so, I mean, they get really good training. You know, a lot of it is trauma, trauma, trauma mm -hmm. type training. And, and I right. stress for my guys. Great. There's trauma. You know, I can teach anybody to, to do trauma because it's very limited on what you can do. But the other aspect is all the other medical non-traumatic uh, emergencies or, you know, problems that can occur on a trip, um, on, a, on a, a jet, on a yacht somewhere or while you're moving where you need to kind of determine, hey, is this, you know, something that needs to go to the hospital? Is this something we can kind of treat here, get our medical director or telemedicine service online and, and talk to them about it? Um, and that's kind of where, you know, I want to see our team start to go is, you know, what do you do for your client or what do you do for just your, 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 you know, the guy that's working on the right or the left of you, you know, cause it's not just the client, it's, it's the whole team. If someone goes down in your team, I mean, that kind of will stop everything from continuing forward. Yeah. From what I'm hearing out there in the industry, a lot of family offices actually have an on-site EMT certified or paramedic certified agent in a, addition to the, you know, the EP guys and gals that support the high network. Is that, is that an ongoing thing you're seeing the, the family office or the high network family offices are accepting that to be a standard? Uh, I don't know if it's a standard yet. I, I do see that there's, there's more that are interested in talking about it. I know there's lots of corporate EP, EP teams who will have uh, agents or employees that are security based with the EMT background, yet have no medical direction, but they still want to work under um, Good Samaritan, which you really can't. I mean, Good Samaritan was meant for the random Joe that comes along, helps someone out, may have caused harm, but is not getting paid for, for services. So, you know, to prevent people from not getting involved, they said, hey, look, Good Samaritan, if you have good intentions to help something bad happens, we're going to, you know, keep you, uh, you know, fiscally, you know, under what's the word, uh, fiscally not responsible for any injuries. Well, if you're hiring an EP agent and they have an EMT, but they don't have medical direction and they're carrying medical bags and they provide medical care and something bad happens or if something happens, they technically are are practicing out of their scope because they're not practicing, um, you know, EMTs and med pet paramedics have a, a, a scope of practice, what they can do in the county or state that they're working, but it has to be overseen by some kind of medical director, medical direction. Um, and if they don't have it, then technically they can't practice in that scope. Uh, but 
I mean, this is kind of what some of these corporate and some big corporations, if I told you the names, you'd be like, you'd be shocked. And, you know, and they're like, yeah, it's worked for us, you know, and we're going to continue on. I mean, more power to you, you know, if that works for you and you want to kind of deal with the, uh, the blowback, if something happens, then, you know, that's what you're going to have to do. What are you most excited about? I mean, here's a, here's a question. What what are the things about the industry that kind of turns you off? Well, let's go there first. Turns the things me that off. you see and yeah, turns you off about the executive protection industry. Turns me off. Um, yeah, that needs to be worked on to do better. Um, I mean, I understand that this is uh, you know uh, an alpha. And I won't even say male anymore because it can be alpha female dominated, but obviously more alpha male dominated uh, field. And so with that comes egos. And sometimes with that comes what I do is right and I don't want to change or that idea is not important to me. Um, so it kind of inhibits change and sometimes inhibits change for the better. Um, I get it. Been there, done that or, you know, I've been so bullheaded and I just don't want to hear you know, what you have to say, because it's really going to just complicate my life and sounds expensive. And, you know, what, what are the reasons I don't want to make that change? Um, so that's probably one thing. Uh, I mean, the other thing is, is the politics in uh, the politics and business and NEP. It's, it's something I haven't personally have to deal with too much, but I've seen it with other things that go around is you just see some of this cutthroat and, and I, and I don't know if it's EP or if it's just business and you know, that's the way <laughs> business, but, and I know in business right. it's very cutthroat. So sure. it may just be a part business of the switch. business aspect of EP and not EP itself, but the you culture know, of business. I mean, uh, look, I mean, uh, I, my whole main function is to collaborate with others, right? Got it. Um, I work with, with security teams, EP teams. So maybe I'm a little, um, out of kind of that, that, the politics, you know, there's not too many people uh, that do what I do. So maybe there's just the competition's not there to, to kind of have to deal with, you know, the, sure. the daily, you know, political backlash or the bad yeah. mouth thing. So, right. uh, but yeah, I mean, look, we should all work together. Uh, sometimes, you know, when businesses work together and collaborate, it's a lot better than them spending their resources fighting each other. Right. What do you, what do you see as the positive as the future at the, at the uh, optimism of the, Industry, as you've been in this, what, three years now, what are you most excited about and what you see going forward in this industry being a doctor? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there, like, like we, you know, mentioned earlier, I think there is a slow, um, just kind of gradual change that's, you know, helping implement, you know, medicine. I see lots of big name guys um, talking about it all the time. Uh, on LinkedIn and doing podcasts, you know, I know EP access and Christian West and those guys and the source and they're all talking about, you know, medical and Aaron molding and they're, you know, they're, they're, they're pushing it. So I, I think it, everybody's starting to realize, listen, we need to do this for our clients because the reality is, is in security, look, we're trying to prevent, or we're trying to keep a, a scene safe, a client safe, a principal safe, a resident safe. And the reality is, is we're always going to have failures. And when there's a failure, there's probably going to be an injury. Um, it may not be an injury. It may just be monetary loss of something. But if there is an injury, then we need to have a backup plan. You know, just like we have a backup plan, if, you know, route one is not going to work and we go route two, we have to have a backup plan where, you know, client is injured. And now what are we going to do? Um, so, you know, that, that's the big thing I'm pushing and a lot of, uh, you know, us in the medical uh, on the medical side and in the industry are pushing and, and it's slowly, but surely it's going. Yeah. You know, I, to change the topic a little bit, we, we hearing all over the news that there's a shortage of nurses out there. Nobody wants to work in the, the hospital industry because it's just, it's too stressful after going through the pandemic of COVID and all that. What are you seeing? I mean, you get, you get the pulse, you're down there in Southern California. What, what are you seeing the shift and change in the medical industry? Is it for the better yeah. For the worse? Is oh, what? Get I better? No, I think it's for the worse. Okay. Um, okay. Which makes it even more important for, you know, us in the EP industry to, to be able to, you know, manage our, our clients, you know, even sometimes medically. So I just worked a shift last night till one in the morning. 
Uh, we were fully staffed for docs. There was multiple nurse call offs, which affects kind of patient flow. Mm -hmm. And from what I'm hearing is, is just kind of post COVID, um, everybody's burnt out. I mean, we're talking not just nurses, we're talking CT techs, mm. uh, respiratory therapists, even, you know, those who help, you know, the clerks up front, um, doctors, the nurses, everybody is burnt out. I mean, even the cafeteria staff, one day I showed up, they're supposed to be open until seven at night. I was going to grab some food before, you know, the night shift. And they're like, oh, we're closed for 15 minutes because there's only two of us working. Wow. Yeah. You know? So you've got the clerk, you got one guy in the back on the, in the kitchen and, and, uh, you know, Man. the clerk ringing up your food and, and they're like, yeah, nobody wants to work, you know, nobody wants. And so they literally close the kitchen for 15 minutes so they can take their 15 minute break. So, you know, and, and I, I don't know if it's, it's all medicine specific. It sounds like it's industry wide all over the place. And, you know, maybe this, uh, uh economic slowdown is, is worth it. So people can reset because I think with COVID there was mm. this mindset of, oh, free money. And yeah. we're going to just take, we're going to take it. We don't have to work. We'll be able to collect this, that, and the other. And now it's like, oh, well, uh, no more money and there's no more jobs. So now you have Wait. to get back and start fighting for a job. So, you Interesting. know, to be honest with you, the, uh, the uh, economic slowdown, this inflation, this thing we're, we're looking at, which nobody wants to admit is, is going on, is maybe a good thing to kind of reset us back That's to That's a good school. conversation. I never thought about it that way, but that you just put that light switch on a dark room. I'm like, I never thought about it that way, but that's probably true. Yeah. I mean, if everything was great and the money was still coming in, I mean, we would have a society that just wants to sit at home and, and just collect free money. Well, we all know money's not free. Those in the, you know, in the business field, you know, right. So what is the morale in the medical industry right now? Is it pretty high or is it versus really low as the lows it's ever been because yeah. we just got out of the pandemic? You know, I, I think the pandemic put a big um, hurt on a lot of these HMOs and these healthcare plans. Mm. And they're no longer operating in a profit. And uh, right. when that when that you know, when they're operating in a profit, they're happy, which basically trickles okay. down to the doctors, the nurses, and everybody else, right? People start to get their cost of living increases, maybe a raise. Um, but since they've been operating um, poorly the last couple of years, it's basically started to, you know, come downhill. Like we were just told basically um, that we were, as physicians, we were supposed to work 20 hours uh, by the end of this year um, for free. What? Oh, what absolutely. Hundred percent. Goes to medical school to work for free. What doctor they, does they, that? A company that probably brings in ninety plus billion dollars in revenue um, wants all the doctors in Southern California for this group, and I'm not going to mention what to basically work twenty hours for free, and they say to to increase access so the patients get get seen, wow. but they don't want to pay us for it. Well, I'm like, well, how about we we just work those 20 hours and you just pay us. Oh, well, no, financially, we can't afford that. So I'm like, okay, no problem. They're yeah. a billion dollar organization. Billion, multiple billion. We're not going to say who. I, I won't I, say who. I was just to protect that in your job. So we won't go there. Well, I, I don't even, to be honest with you, I don't care. I, I'd say it. I'm <laughs> not going to say it. I don't need the headache, but. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Wow. That, what would you call that? Greed? Or would you call that? What would you call that from the insurance layers and the red tape what would you describe I would, that being i would call that administrators completely out of touch what they just implemented on all their physicians in their network completely out of touch and they're going to look back on it and go we literally just and, and here's the reality i'll work an extra 20 hours i've been volunteering for the last 20 years with the sheriff's department and doing all other kinds of work but when a company like that does that to you, it kind of gives you a real sour taste in your mouth of like what they actually think of you. And I think that's part of it. During COVID, um, the nurses, the docs weren't getting the equipment needed, yet they still had the equipment, but they were just kind of holding it, waiting in case COVID got worse and the N95s weren't getting to us. And, and you start to realize, OK, well, we're basically expendable. You know, if mm. we die, we die. You know, you'll just kind of kick us to the side, hire someone else. Um, so I think people just start to realize that, like, listen, you know, our family, 
you know, our friends are first, you know, our jobs are, you know, way at the bottom of the line. And I'm talking about the medical industry because you guys obviously didn't care for us. Like we thought you would care for us and, you know, they see it for what it is. So, and I think that doesn't help the morale uh, of the place. I mean, if, wow. if, you, if you did a survey of the morale of the place, so I'm going to say on a scale of zero to 10, it's probably down three or four points compared to five years ago. Whoa. That is a huge two hour podcast right there. <laughs> Just yeah. that, that little topic. Because it's in your organization, that's how people feel about that. And I, I have been hearing there's just a, a huge lacking of doctors that want to even get in the medical field anymore. There's no the, the money's not there like it used to be from from private yeah, practice. Yeah. Oh, it, so look, if you want to get to to the medical field uh, to make tons of money, like they were making in the '80s and the '90s, where if like you pulled a toenail or something, you were making thousand dollars. That's no longer there. Look, I, uh, and by all means, medicine should be for someone who enjoys the medicine, enjoys helping others. If you just sure. don't need to make medicine, you'll be absolutely miserable. There's a lot of better ways and mm. easier ways. Um, I mean, tell, spend four years doing TikTok or whatever, whatever people are doing these days, you know, to make money. They're, you know, these kids that are 19, 20 making, you know, tens right. of millions of dollars. Don't spend the next uh, eight, nine years of your life between undergrad medical school and then spend <laughs> another three to six years doing a residency so you can make 400 grand a year. You're wasting your time. Um, wow. it's, it's for people, um, if you're just motivated by money, you're not going to do well. Wow. Yeah. There's, it's interesting how the internet and social media has changed that dynamic because of the kids and what they want to do for a living. Yeah. It's just blowing me away. Yeah. I mean, Instagram became a thing what last five years ago, TikTok just lost two years and everybody's making millions just off of posting a, a video for 30 seconds. Boom. They're mill- I was like, yeah. how does that work? Yeah. But it's teaching the culture of laziness. It just, the work ethic is just not there. I mean, we had a big project in Northern California. And I, I jokingly say to my teams, I, you know what? Let's bring the Southern California agents up. Get will outwork anybody in Northern California. It just, it's just a different work ethic. Right. And it's just like you said, that's a good point. You know, they'd rather do TikTok videos than go to, you know, spend eight years to become an MD. And there used to be honor in work there used to be integrity and i don't know what happened the generation gap it's just if you're if you are listening to this podcast and if you are in that 30 age group hey we need you guys we need your help america yeah. needs you to step up and have some honor integrity and work hard we need yeah. you we we need you guys to uh be part of that labor force right. that's just that's what makes america great 